Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the second academic virtual meetup sponsored by the National Institute of Statistical Sciences. I'm Amy Kim from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and I'm a NIST board member. I will be the moderator for this meetup. Today, we will be discussing strategies for improving our communication skills, which are, of course, essential to achieve success as a statistician, given that our jobs by nature involve frequent communication with others. So here is the schedule of our one hour meetup. After my brief introductory remarks, Dr. Christy Chuang Stein will give a 20 minute talk focused on oral communication and presentation skills. This will be followed by five minutes for questions for Dr. Chuang Stein. Then Dr. Limin Peng will give a 20 minute presentation on writing skills. And we will have another five minutes for questions for Dr. Peng. And then at the very end, we may have a little extra time for further discussion and wrap up. So a few um, words about the logistics. Our Zoom hosts today are Glenn Johnson and James Rosenberger, the director of NIST. All attendees are view only participants, but we encourage you to ask questions. You can submit a question during a speaker's presentation using the Q&A feature on the Zoom window. To do this, you just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the window, type in your question, and then click enter. And we'll try to field as many questions as time allows. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Christy Twangstein. Christy received a bachelor's degree in mathematics from National Taiwan University and her PhD in statistics from the University of Minnesota. She retired from Pfizer as vice president and head of the Statistical Research and Consulting Center in 2015 after 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry and five years in academia. Christy is the owner and principal consultant of Twangstein Consulting. She's a fellow of the American Statistical Association, has more than 160 peer reviewed publications and book chapters, and has also published three books. Christy received the ASA Founder Award in 2012 and the Distinguished Achievement Award of the International Chinese Statistical Association in 2014. Okay, so I will now turn the mic over to Christy. Thank you very much, Mimi, for the very nice uh, presentation. I also want to thank Mimi for inviting me to share my personal experience in improving my communications and presentation skills. Improving our, our skills is a lifelong journey. During my journey, I have found a few useful pointers. I would like to share them with you today. These pointers are key and to my uh, own journey. They are by no means exhaustive. Nevertheless, they are a good place to start. We strive to influence others through our words and actions. Good communication and presentation skills help us accomplish that. President Lincoln once said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. This quote describes the importance of a sharp toolkit. I will focus on oral communication first. This slide includes eight simple tips on communication. They are beware of our own and other styles. Learn to be a good listener, being kind and generous with sincere praises. Practice humility, solicit others' input regularly, choose our words carefully, project optimism and positivity. Finally, communicate often and proactively. I will go into details on some of these points. What is your style? Are you an extrovert or introvert? Are you a sensor or an intuitive communicator? An extrovert speaks freely about one's inner thoughts and feelings. An introvert keeps more in and shy away from telling others what to do. A sensor speaks with detail and precision, often using numbers, details, and lists. An intuitive communicator speaks more generally and conceptually. They like the whole pictures, but may leave out key details. Why are styles important, you might ask? It is because if we talk in abstract terms to a sensor who wants facts and data, we will only frustrate them. 
Similarly, if we go into great length on numbers and lists when discussing solutions with the individual governed by intuition, we will frustrate them as well. Additionally, are you a thinker or a feeler? Do you perceive or judge? Do you focus on what is right, possibly at the expense of human feelings, or is it more important for you to communicate warmth and tolerance? Understanding the personal trait of the individual with whom we are having a conversation and our own trait will greatly increase the effectiveness of our communication. The older I get, the more I'm convinced of the positive impact of sincere compliments. When we compliment someone, we unintentionally helped the individual set a higher standard for themselves. Remembering our previous compliment, the individual will likely work harder to be worthy of our compliment when we interact again. As a Chinese, this is something I had to work hard at. You see, my mother was a tiger mom. She rarely complimented her kids. Perhaps she was worried that compliments would make us feel that we were good enough and therefore stopped working hard. She probably did not realize that all people, especially kids, needed compliment, compliment and confirmation. Well-timed and well-placed compliments have a way to build confidence and esteem in others. We enjoy sharing experience with others. When doing this, it is important to remember not to overly draw attention to ourselves. A good conversation should be two-way exchange and not about me, me, and only me. This is true even during a job interview. We need to practice humility even when we have much to share. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves, it is thinking of ourselves less. Do you like to talk to people who project optimism and positivity? I do. I'm not talking about blinded optimism or phoning positivity here. When I talk to someone who is smiling and has a sunny disposition, I feel good. We love smiling babies and sunny blue sky because they convey hope and warmth. The more we communicate, the better we will be at communication. I don't mean Twitter, instant messaging type of communication. I mean full blown dialogue. I chuckled each time when I saw the sign. The sign encouraged people to talk to each other. Talking to each other has become less and less frequent in our current social environment. We need to make an effort to have personal dialogue with somebody. The next slide lists several communication traps. I will focus on three of them. The first one is our tendency to use the word but too often and sometimes too early in our conversation. Imagine a situation where a colleague proposes a new approach. How long will it take before you use the word but in responding to the proposal? Statisticians are trained to be scientifically critical. We are good at finding fault and we are good at using the word but. Unfortunately, the minute we use the word but, others' defensive met antenna goes up. There are other ways we could express our opinions that may minimize the defensiveness in others. For example, we can acknowledge the innovation behind the proposal first and ask whether the presenter had thought of a way to address some potentially challenging aspects of the new approach. Give other people the benefit of doubt. The next one is to let worry about our accent or our difficulty with certain words keep us from speaking up in a meeting. I have struggled with this for a long time, probably all my life. Fortunately, I'm older and bolder now. I have found that the only way to overcome this worry is simply to speak up. 
and constantly think about what I would say if I get called upon in a meeting. The third one is not realizing that sometimes we may be the problem when misunderstanding occurs. We may have operated on an incomplete set of facts, or we may have interpreted events in a way that reflects our own belief system. There is an interesting cartoon that says, we have met the enemy and he is us. When engaging in a conversation about disagreement, it is helpful to remove emotions and look at the situation in an objective manner. Let's move to presentation now. We celebrated Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday last week. News outlets ran various pieces of King's speech during his lifetime. His I Have a Dream speech in 63 during the March for Jobs and Freedom in Washington, D.C. captivated many in the nation. You may say, but King was a great orator. I'm just an ordinary person. Let's look at Lou Gehrig next. Lou Gehrig played baseball for the Yankees for 17 seasons. He was beloved by his fans. Lou Gehrig was diagnosed with ALS on his 36th birthday on June 19th in 1939. ALS destroys one's motor function of the central nervous system. Yankees announced his retirement two days later and held a Lou Gehrig's Appreciation Day on July 4th in Yankee Stadium. Lou Gehrig gave his farewell speech to a sold out crowd. Lou Gehrig was not a gifted speaker like King, but his speech was regarded as baseball's Gettysburg Address because he spoke from his heart, because of his humility, because he faced his ordeal with such great, great, with such grace and optimism. Do you think Lou Gehrig was nervous when he gave his farewell speech? I'm sure he was, especially since he was facing a life-changing condition at that moment. Speaking in public does not come naturally for many of us. Very few of us are so lucky to be born with little or no fear of public speaking. When a child learns to walk and falls down 50 times, they never ask whether walking may not be for them. They are fearless and keep on trying until they get it. We adults cheer them on. We need to cultivate that childlike attitude concerning public speaking. A good talk is when the speaker puts their heart into it. When the speaker can capture the audience's attention early on and keep it throughout the talk. The talk should be on a well-focused subject with a scope suitable for the time allocated. Nothing is more irritating than a speaker who goes on and on and on with no regard for the schedule. A talk is good when the speaker displays confidence in the contents and the delivery matches the contents. A talk is good when there is a personal story embedded in the talk. With the above said, it is easy to point out things we should pay attention to when preparing for a talk. We should choose a subject that we feel excited about. We should visualize how the presentation will open and how it will end. One thing I do for all my pre presentations is to write out what I'm going to say during the first three minutes. I want to make sure that the opening is smooth. A good start is halfway to success, as Chinese says. A good start also stabilizes us. We want to capture the audience's attention and capture it early. We need to connect with the audience, acknowledging their presence, and making the presentation fun for them by using pictures whenever possible. What are some of the things we should avoid? Never apologize at the beginning by saying that I didn't have time to, pre to prepare 
or I don't know why I was invited. These statements are instant distractors. Avoid indulging in a long and leisurely introduction, and you don't have time for the main part of the presentation. Don't overload the, the, um, the audience with too much details, even for a technical pr uh, presentation. Don't think we can just wing it. Most of us are not that good at just winging it. Finally, avoid using words that could trip us. Before I conclude, I want to share a story with you. One evening, an old Cherokee grandfather told his grandson about a battle between two wolves residing within each one of us. One wolf symbolizes evil. It's angry, jealous, greedy, arrogant, and resentful. The other wolf symbolizes good. It's joyful, peaceful, loving, kind, and generous. The grandson thought about it for a minute and asked, which wolf wins out in the end? The old Cherokee smiled and replied, the one you feed. There is no alternative to just do it if we want to become more effective at communication and presentation. The only way to overcome fear is to follow fear. It's like what is being said about success. There's no elevator to success. We have to take the stairs. The process may be hard, but the view at the top is worth all the steps you took to get there. Many of us enjoy hiking. This is like hiking up the trail, one step at a time to the mountain top. Thank you. Back to you, Mimi. You are on mute. Thank you, Christy, um, for that very helpful uh, presentation on those, um, and those excellent pointers on how to improve our communication skills. Um, let's see. Uh, so as we have some time for some questions for um, Dr. Chuang-Stein, um, as we wait for some of them to come in, I have a few questions to ask you. Um, so the statistics, the statistics field includes a lot of people um, who, like you, learned English as a second language. Um, was there any particular activity that you did that you felt was particularly effective in helping you to improve your oral communication skills? Like, did you purposely um, do a lot of teaching or socialize with you know, fluent English speakers? You know, uh, it, when I first started, I found myself talking to me a, a lot aloud. So I would practice saying a particular sentence that is, was particularly hard for me. And I did spend time talking to my English speaking classmates or, you know, we, or office mates. I know many of us wanted to go to universities where there is a large concentration of people from our own countries. It's comfortable, it's comforting to talk to our dear countrymen. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't help improving our English. I remember many times attending conferences and I see a lot of group people kind of meeting up. They were talking their own languages, you know, especially, I know there are a lot of Chinese uh, students. I always jokingly say, speak English, speak English. And it, it, it language something that the more we use it, the better we get it. I have a colleague at Pfizer who took on the, uh, the head position of a small biofarm uh, company in Boston. I recently visited him and the company hired an executive coach for him. And this was very common for the top position. And he told me why the executive coach advised him in terms of improving his English. His advisor advised him to speak to his son in English for half an hour every day. So that just shows you know, the importance of using the language as a part of improving our language. So truly just use it and practice it more. Great. Also, um, I think that many of us in, in the field, including myself, um, would be considered you know, introverts. One reason why we go into a quantitative field. Um, 
any advice for overcoming our natural tendencies, for example, in a meeting to, to lean out rather than lean in and participate? That, that, that's a good question. And you are right. Many of us are introverts. You know, I wouldn't consider myself to be an extrovert either. Um, it's something we just have to force ourselves to do. And I am, um, fortunately, in my career life, I have been blessed with very good uh, supervisors. One of my boss made me draw up a list you know, on our regular monthly meeting. He said, I want you to give me a list of people you promised you would have coffee break or lunch with. Okay, and then every month, and he would review with me whether I actually did it or not. And so sometimes we have to force ourselves. It was hard at the very beginning because I have to contact the individual and they might say no, they might not have time. But, you know, surprisingly, the majority of them say yes. Once you got some experience, some successes, and then gradually you became more relaxed about it. So this is, again, this is the process. You just have to bite the bullet and get started, and then you will find it easier as we move along. Of course, you know, many people say, but you can't, I don't want you to change my personality or my character. This is not about changing personality. We are who we are. It's about changing our behavior. If we want to be successful in this society, we need to adapt or adopt some of the behaviors that will make us effective. And forcing ourselves out is one way. I heard an old saying saying a ship in a harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Or if you want to be a diamond, you need to be willing to be cut. So there are all those saying that you, know, you just have to go through the pain sometimes, the sweat and pain to get where you want to be, assuming you want to get to a better place. Also, I think what I found um, helps um, me personally in terms of participating in meetings or in conference calls is if there's an agenda that's circulated ahead of time, just really think about it, about what is um, going to be addressed during that meeting or conference call and, and, and sort of have prepared a couple of ideas that you want to contribute. Um, I find that that, that helps uh, participation. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and um, let's see. Um, okay, we have one question. Um, oh, so Dan Jeske wants to know, how do you get the floor? <laughs> how do you get the floor in meetings when there are speakers who want to dominate the conversation? That's a great question. Right. Yes, it's a very good one. And that, that's the case when I'm hoping that a good moderator, a good chair could moderate. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's very hard for other members to have a equal kind of a good airtime if we have a dominant member. So a good moderator, a good chair should kind of uh, come in at that point and politely stop the, that, that person. It's not always easy. We, we have some... Um, some statisticians who are pretty dominant themselves, it's very hard to find some airtime when they are around. But I'm hoping uh, a chair would do that for the group. Um, I also want to go back to your point about the importance of having an optimistic and positive attitude and how much that influences others. Um, it reminded me of the advice that Tommy Wright, uh, another NIST board member, gave during our last meetup that we had on how to get a job in statistics. You know, he said, uh, behave in a way at the workplace so that you would want to hire yourself. Um, and I think that um, being optimistic and, and being positive is a, is a big part of that. Um, but given, you know, the inevitable challenges and failures and stresses that we face in our jobs, um, how can we better foster that sort of positive outlook, um, you know, in not only ourselves, but in people we might manage in our workplace? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a good question. It's hard for, for many of us who came from a very competitive world. And also we had very critical parents when we grew up. The, the one important thing is that we need to like ourselves first too. It, it sounds easy, but it's really not very easy. Just think about how many times do we 
gave a presentation, we sort of berated ourselves afterwards. So thinking, well, I should have done this. I could have done this. Oh boy, I did a bad job. When other people say, oh, you did a very good job. Sometimes we are more critical of ourselves than we are critical of other people. It's important for us to be liking ourselves. And um, if we feel good about ourselves, sometimes I find it's easier to also be very positive about the whole thing. The glass half full and half empty a phenomenon is important, a reminder. And it, the, there's this interest contrast even within my own household. My husband being American, he is a glass half full person. I'm more the glass half empty type of person. So reminding ourselves that we need to look at what we have instead of focusing on what we don't have. You know, a lot of those can help us have a different outlook about things. And the other things that sometimes I mention to Chinese parents is um, when your kid come home with a 95 out of 100 on the score, instead of focusing on a 95, very often we say, why did you, what did you go wrong on the other five point? How come you missed such an easy one? My husband's response would be, oh, 95, you got an A, let's go celebrate. And I would say, only 95, the other person got 100. Who got the highest score in the class? So in a way, we need to focus on what we do have, what is there, rather than chasing what is not there. I think that would help some of our luck. Um, okay, now we have one question from Gideon Bond, um, who asks, in your experience, if you have one or two things um, that you did to succeed, what, what are they? So what are the one or two key things that you did that helped in your professional success? By one or two things. <laughs> hmm. I think one, one thing is, um, um, one thing I found very important is work with your, well, I work mostly in, in industry. So it's more work closely with your manager. A manager has a way to grow you um, if, if they consider you to be a promising candidate. Uh, and as I said, you know, I, I have been blessed with good managers. There are a few things that we also need to do on our part. For example, you never embarrass your manager in public even though we might not disagree with the manager, but you never, never say it in public. So I found that there are social etiquettes that might be more important than our technical skills. And always credit, give credit to other people when credit is due. And don't worry about, or don't be afraid of sharing your work with other people even though the ideas might be coming from us. You know, some people might say, well, this is my idea. I'm not going to share with the other people. I'm not going to put their name on this publication because I came up with this idea. The thing is, if you share the credit with them, if you invite them to join you, they will share their work with you as well. It's always nice to extend the invitation to others when you have the opportunity because that opens the door to opportunities that they will bring to you. So you just never know, build a bridge. Build a bridge is, I find, is one of the most important long-term investment I have made in my life. Right, I mean, I think being a generous colleague, it's, it's really a win-win, right? It's, yes. Everybody benefits, so. Yes, um, indeed. Okay, well, thanks again, Christy, um, for all those um, excellent uh, pieces of advice. So uh, we're now gonna switch gears and have a presentation on writing skills with Dr. Lemon Peng. Uh, Dr. Peng is professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at the Rollins School of Public Health of Emory University. She obtained her PhD in statistics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her master's in probability theory and mathematical statistics 
from the University of Science and Technology of China. Her methodologic research focuses on survival analysis, quantile regression, and non-parametric and semi-parametric inference. She serves as associate editor for the Journal of the American Statistical Association and Biometrics. Dr. Pang was elected as fellow of the American Statistical Association in 2016 and received the American Public Health Association Mortimer Spiegelman Award in 2017, which honors a statistician below the age of 40 who has made outstanding contributions to health statistics, especially public health statistics. So Dr. Pang, you can take it from here. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I'm very pleased to be here and talk about uh, improving your writing skills. So writing skills are crucially important in the statistical world. So think about our daily work. So we need to write reports for the consulting project. We need to write scientific manuscript. And sometimes we also need to write grant applications. In this slide, I show the pyramid of scales based on the Bloom taxonomy. Basically, uh, based on this figure, we can see that the writing scale belongs to the kind of top category of the pyramid of scales. So this means that writing is built upon many different factors. For example, the knowledge, understanding, and critical thinking. So this also means that writing itself clearly is not an easy process. It's a very sophisticated process. So I sound good news. Although writing is not a very easy process, everyone has a basic skill to write well. It may take longer for some people to de develop good writing skills than, some, than the others, but no special talent is required. And I believe writing skills can be trained. So many, also many resources are available to help improving writing skills. For example, in this slide, I show a screenshot from Amazon.com after I type writing skills in the search box. You can find hundreds of books on this topic, which include tremendous information. So today I'm not ambitious to cover all aspects of writing today. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, so I will only talk about some essential aspects for, the, for improving writing skills based on my, as judged based on my own experience. I hope you will find some of my suggestions are useful to you. And also without further mentioning, this talk is primarily focused on the context of scientific writing. So be, before working on your writing skills, it's important for you to be able to tell which is good writing and which is bad writing. So the common problem you can see, uh, you can find in a poorly written document include typos, grammar mistakes, or jargons that are very hard to understand. And you may also know some kind of repetitive sentences and or some ravelings. At the end, you will feel confused. A good writing is on the countryside. It's on the countryside. So you will say the language is very clean and clear, having little typos and grammar issues, and sentences are logically connected. And after you finish reading, you will feel you get a very clear message and uh, you are convinced. So the difference, uh, the different set of kind of the features attached to bad writing and good writing indicates a clear direction for improving the writing skills. So here I would like to elaborate two basic characteristics of good writing. So the first one is clarity. A basic component of correct, a correct, a, a, a clarity is the correct language, such as correct spelling, grammar, and punctuation. And also, it's better to use a formal tone rather than informal tone. For example, when I was in graduate school, I was advised very early on that, okay, try to use those kind of formal language like therefore, instead of using so. And, and try not to use contractions in your papers. For example, I can't, it isn't, and so on. So, and also a common suggestion you may have heard about a good a scientific writing is to be concise and succinct. Uh, one simple approach to achieve succinct writing is to use simple and short sentences. Per this is particularly true for inexperienced writer. So for example, if you use a kind of long and complex sentences, so um, you have higher chance to get kind of grammar mistakes, and also it can confuse people sometimes. And throwing jargon without um, proper context should also be avoided. 
jargon can be, for example, jargon can be a scientific term which is not properly introduced. For example, if I uh, if I'm writing a survival analysis paper and at the beginning I just say, okay, the AFT model is a very useful approach, then this will be a jargon for readers who is not the expert in survival analysis. So readers can feel lost from encountering many jargons. Coherence is another critical factor. Simply speaking, coherence means the materials in your writing are organized or arranged in a logical order. So with a coherent, stru uh, a coherent structure, it will be easier for readers to understand your arguments and accept your conclusions. Achieving coherence requires a good standing of the materials in your writing uh, so that it can be arranged in a kind of in some way that makes sense. And this also reflects by the skill pyramid I showed in an earlier slide. So understanding and reasoning are involved in the layers below the category that involves writing. So there are different uh, styles of logically organizing materials. So here I give some examples. Division, compare, contrast, cost effect, problem analysis solution. So division basically means starting with the main idea and then discussing the parts. For example, um, I, I probably I can write, competing risk problem is challenging. Then after that, I can discuss the specific challenges. And compare contrast means putting conclusion up front, then using some familiar facts to explain the unfamiliars. For example, I may write, semi-competing risk problem is challenging. And similar to the competing risk problem, it, it has a challenging from the non-parametric non-identifiability. So in this example, basically, I use the competing risk as a familiar fact um, by, uh, to explain uh, the semi-competing risk problem, which is more unfamiliar to uh, many readers. The cost effect basically means list, listing the causes first, then discussing the consequence. Problem and, uh, analysis solution means presenting the problem first, analyzing the causes of a problem, and then provide a solutions. So for example, I can write, it's not straightforward to analyze the survival data from these cancer clinic trials. And this is because the subject, uh, subjects in this data set, set may die from different, course of, uh, different courses. And this form a competing research problem. And uh, to solve this problem, we can apply the cost-specific hazard regression method. So in this example, basically, I first kind of present the problem and, say, and explain, OK, what caused the problem, and then provide some solutions. So based on your need, you, can, you should kind of select the style that fits your context the best. It often takes writing and rewriting to achieve the best results on coherence. So how to write with clarity and coherence? So the typical writing procedure includes five steps. Pre-writing, or say free writing, means that we just kind of put down all materials and information. Drafting basically means, OK, connecting all the different pieces together to form a draft. Revising means uh, improving the current draft. And the editing, the editing, hopefully, by a fresh eye. And finally, presenting. So based on my experience, it will be very useful to keep in mind some very simple rules during the whole writing process. So for example, when drafting, try to use the formal tone in the first place, rather than write, uh, writing with some kind of oral language. And uh, also, um, you try to use kind of simple and short sentence whenever it's possible. You can fix these issues uh, during the steps of the re revising. So when revising uh, your draft, the, the kind of most basic thing you need to do is to check the spellings and grammars. You want to have a very clean language. A more important task is to polish language so that you can make the words and sentences more precise and also have some variations. And another important task is to kind of to check the structure. Okay, you try to arrange the main points in your paper until they are in a very logical order. So, um, and if, if possible, try to have a fresh eye to help proofread or edit your manuscript or your writing. So the same considerations for the revi revising stage may also be checked again during the stage of uh, editing. So here we can see that, okay, writing with clarity and coherence 
is not easy, but is doable. So in this slide, I, I would like to make a start about an important point, which is good writing is not equal to effective writing. So for example, as a, a kind of standing member of the, uh, the BMRD study session, so from time to time, I have seen some grant applications which are presented with very clear language, coherent structure, and convincing argument, but did not get favorable reviews. So why? A, ma a major reason is that this application read like a combination of several well-written papers with lots of details. It didn't come across like a proposal that delivers some exciting pictures of broad future scientific impact. The main mistake in such a case is that the writer did not carefully consider two critical questions. The first question is, who will read your writing? The second question is, what is the purpose of your writing? So in this example, so basically the writer perceived one reviewer kind of work the same as the paper referee. The writer also didn't take into account that the papers and the grant application do not serve for the same purpose. So carefully thinking about who are the potential readers of your writing can help make more effective uh, writing. So for example, for a statistical paper, the first group of readers are referees who are likely to have the highly relevant statistical expert expertise to your work. So they may be interested in reading technical details in order to determine the validity of your work and also to assess the technical advancement. So in such a case, Sufficient technical details um, may be a very necessary component of your writing. For grant application, grant reviewers sometimes do not have kind of very matched statistical expertise. For example, an epidemiologist may review some kind of statistical methods grants and survival analysis. So in this case, elaborating technical details such as kind of theoretical proofs is not an effective way to support your proposal. This is not only because the technical details are hard to understand to some of the reviewers, but also because you will lose some very special, uh, kind of precious space to clarify things that are important to the reviewers. So in this example, a more effective writing strategy is probably to illustrate the importance of the technical issues and the promising of the proposed solution in some non-technical way. So for example, by simulations, or by some kind of real data examples. So similarly, it's key to structure your writing based on the purpose of your writing. So different purpose uh, are connected to different kind of evaluation criteria. So for example, evaluating a paper um, are mainly based on the judgment of the potential impact. An uh, uh, evaluating a statistic paper is often based on the correctness of the methods and also the innovation of the methods or applications. So for a grant, so the evaluation are mainly based on the judgment um, of the potential impact of the proposal work. So to attain a favorable outcome, this consideration needs to play an important role in planning the structure of your writing. So for example, for paper, including sufficient technical details can help support the validity of the work and also show the technical advancement. As a result, you may need to be mindful to include sufficient technical details in your writing. For a grant, it's crucial, uh, it's crucial to clearly demonstrate the uh, broad impact of the proposed work. So for example, in the NIH grant uh, uh, setting, a useful writing strategy is to integrate the discussion of methods with real data sets or applications. This can particularly help uh, reviewers who are not in your field to better understand, okay, what the new methods will lead to and what are the impact. So in this case, very specialized technical details may not be needed and sometimes can be distracting. So in summary, Adopting your, adapting your writing to the potential readers and the purpose of the writing can help make more effective, can help more effectively transforming the information from your writing to the readers. This would ultimately help you to achieve the best outcome. So in this slides, I just present a very general checklist for the traits of effective writing. 
So here, the idea means delivering clear messages that serves a specific a purpose. The organization means a coherent structure. The voice means uh, some unique way of expressing ideas. The word choice means more precise language. And sentence fluency means smooth transition between sentences and also variation across sentences. For example, different beginnings or different lengths. The co convention means um, following the basic standard of punctuation, capitalization, spelling, and grammar. So in this talk, I have primarily emphasized on the component like the idea and organization and convention. So this is because I feel these components are more fundamental to the setting of the scientific writing. So at the end, I want to spend a little bit of time commenting on the common barriers for non-native non speakers and provide some tips based on my own experience. As I discussed earlier, writing is a very complicated process, not only involving the language, but also involving an exercise of comprehension and reason. So for a uh, native speaker like me, major dis uh, disadvantage in terms of writing uh, often relate to limited vocabulary and lack of natural sense of language for English, such as, for example, it sometimes it's, always, always, it's pretty hard for me to decide, okay, when to use the and when to omit the. So this kind of problem would be, would, this issue would, would not be a problem for native speaker. So these barriers can really impact the components such as voice and the word choice and sentence fluency and convention in the checklist I showed earlier for the effective writing. To reduce um, these gaps, so one of my tips is to perform some a critical analysis of some kind of good papers, famous paper in your field, and try to get familiar with, and sometimes even memorize some common vocabularies and the structures of selling ideas and the transition flows. So I, based on my experience, I have found this approach has been very helpful to myself, and I also have suggest this kind of approach to my students. Another suggestion is to uh, be a little bit aggressive to, uh, solicit, uh, to um, aggressively solicit criticism from peers or mentors on your writing. So I, and I think a very famous Chinese saying, um, good medicine tastes bitter. So likewise, negative comments may be more helpful for improving writing skills than praising. Do not be defensive for yourself, uh, kind of be defensive for yourself when facing negative comments. Instead, I would like to suggest you kind of to reflect on what causes negative comments. And through those reflections, you will learn ways to avoid those kind of negative comments in future writing. So the third tip um, kind of share a very similar spirit to the second one. So when provided an edited version of your writing, perhaps from your mentor or from kind of your, the senior author, so don't just directly adopt the changes. Try to take time to go through all the edits and comments and understand why those changes can lead to better writing. So as I always believe, feedback is a gift. So it will be wise to make the best use of such a gift to kind of improve your writing skills. So my last but not the least kind of suggestions for improving writing skills is that please plan ahead. So writing can take lots and lots of time. A big proportion of writing is rewriting and editing. So for myself, this percentage is about 70 to 90%. So if you rush to write, often you have to cut the time for rewriting and editing. So likely this will lead to uh, issues like typos, grammar mistakes, and uh, weak structures. So therefore my last but critical suggestion is, okay, plan ahead and take time to write and rewrite and try your best to achieve the best writing. So as you may have aware, so there are different type of the resources around you to uh, support your, uh, to, and to support you and to help you improve uh, your writing skills. For example, you may so, as, uh, seek support from local writing center in your institution or workplace. And there are also many books around, available and you can also find some uh, many useful presentations uh, online. So in this slide, I only list a few which helped me to prepare this presentation. 
and also I think it can be helpful to you. So at the end, I want to uh, thank, thank you for your attention. I, I welcome questions. Thank you very much, Lemon, uh, for sharing your tips for becoming a better writer. Um, I just wanted to mention that in addition to the excellent resources that you listed on your last slide, um, every year at JSM, NIST offers a day and a half writing workshop for junior researchers. And I know that you, Lemon, were a panelist last year. Um, so I just wanted to inform the attendees um, that they should be on the lookout for announcements that should be coming out later in the spring uh, for the 2019 NIST writing workshop. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's good information for the attendees. Yes. Um, so let's see, we have a question from Ezra Kurum. Um, the first one is, what is your advice to students who are just starting to write their scientific work? Um, for instance, would you recommend that they read more novels or scientific papers or both? I think novels and scientific papers are very different. So I think in this situation, so I would suggest definitely the scientific writings. So I think, so that's my, uh, that's kind of my first tip. So try to just read some kind of the uh, kind of classic papers in your field and just try to understand how they put the introduction. So how they kind of do the literature review, how they kind of sell their ideas, how to emphasize the contribution of their work. And I think that ha has been kind of, that's really my path. So I can give you some example. When I was a kind of graduate student in uh, Wisconsin, so I think I wrote my first dissertation paper. Okay, then my advisor took it, and then he submitted the paper. So pretty much he rewrote the, the, the manuscript, 90% 90, 90 of the manuscript. Okay, so then after, I, then I, after that, so I was quite, uh, and I, 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 don't, I didn't feel good about that. But I, I spent a lot of time, kind of when I wrote my second paper, I just pay a lot of attention to the issues. Well, just we tried, I tried to learn from my advice's writing and to write my second paper. And then also I wrote my third paper. Okay, so for the third paper, my advisor just did a very kind of minor editing, then submitted the paper. Then I feel pretty good about that. So I kind of feel that the, the way to improve your writing, particularly for non-native speaker, so we don't have the same language environment when, when we were in kind of elementary school, middle school, and high school. So writing a different language is not easy for us. So what we, I, I really, the main point I want to make is that you try to learn from others, either from some papers published, or we'll try to kind of learn from um, the editing, what kind of comments from, the kind of the mentors, particularly when you are a student, I think that your, uh, your advisor or some kind of mentors or kind of super kind of project supervisor. So th those are the good resources to kind of look for help for writing. So they may ha not have the time to really specifically teach you, okay, what are the rules for writing? But once they edit your kind of papers, you just take your time and try to figure out why those changes are useful, how they re improve the whole paper. So you try to figure it out by yourself. So that's a kind of self-learning process. Okay, and then um, a second question is, um, what is your advice for getting better at grant writing? <laughs> that's a, that can take an hour and hour to talk about. I think grant writing is, um, I think I first learned paper writing. So because in, in, in the graduate school, so in order to kind of graduate, right? So I first need to publish my papers. And then I started to learn the grant writing after I joined Emory as an assistant professor. So because we're in the biostat department, so I think eventually we need to write our own grant. So I think, um, again, I think I was, based on my experience, I was very fortunate to first, to kind of get a very good mentoring from the senior colleagues. So that's also my advice, kind of my advice for some kind of junior faculties. Try to kind of seek and kind of help from the senior uh, kind of the faculty members. For my experience, I first worked with one of my kind of senior colleagues on some grant application. So we work on the application together. I have great ideas, but I didn't know how to write a grant. So I had some drafts. Then my senior kind of the colleague came to me to say that this is not good enough. You need to, need to write, write, write your ideas for like a grant. So you need to give a, for example, most of reviewers are not really in your field. You need to give, use very simple intuitive language, let them to understand, okay, why the problem is interesting? Why they would be useful? 
So it takes a lot of writing and rewriting to get, get to that point. Rather than writing very technical term, I need to use a very simple intuitive language to explain, particularly to some layman person in my field, about, okay, the importance of my work. Um, and you, you know, you're an associate editor of two leading statistics journals, right? JAZA and Biometrics. How much does the quality of the writing affect your decision about whether to accept a paper? You know, for example, there can be a paper where um, the proposed method is really innovative. They did a great job showing technically through formulas that the, that the uh, method is valid, but there are a lot of grammatical errors and it's poorly organized. So how would you view such a paper? Mm, I think that's a very kind of good question. I think, um, so I think based on my experience, I feel that writing is very important. So I think the, the reasons probably um, is kind of twofolded. So first, um, so if I read the paper with very poor writing, so it gave me very bad impression. So when the paper, the, the kind of the work is kind of on the boundary, I would be more inclined to reject a paper because of writing. Okay, so um, for, the, for the other case you just mentioned, so if the idea is really cre uh, creative, it's very novel, but the writing is very poor. So still the, the, the bad writing can have a very negative impact on the outcome of the paper. So some re rephrase, because everybody, people is very busy, right? So they may not read your paper line by line, try, trying to figure out your idea. So even though you have great idea, so if they just if they just if you don't have good writing, you didn't kind of uh, um, kind of present your idea in a very clear way. The referee may misunderstand your idea, may not kind of get it, get the, the right idea. Then they they may re recommend the rejection of the paper. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in either case, you can see the poor writing can have a very negative impact on the outcome of the paper. And you know, a lot of statisticians though, unfortunately, are working at places where there aren't a lot of uh, resources. Um, like there's no writing center, for example, um, to, to help, um, especially those for whom English is not their first language. So what do you recommend uh, for, for such individuals? Um, are there sort of online professional editing services that you're aware of, uh, other resources that they could tap into? Yes, I think there are some online editorial kind of service available. So if, for example, if you're just in Google, you type the kind of the uh, writing help. So you can get a bunch of lists of uh, kind of the uh, kind of places you can really get kind of the help probably you need to pay for the service but there are some kind of online editing service available so and um, i think based on my experience i think for for kind of starter for kind of the student editing probably is more helpful because this can help you at least help you to correct the kind of the issues with language like typos and grammar grammar uh, issues and so on but as you get more experience as you get kind of more confident, uh, confident about your writing. I think you really need to focus on the structure uh, of your writing because that's very important. You want to make sure that you every, organize something in a very compelling way. So uh, I think to figure out, as I mentioned earlier, in order to figure the best kind of structure, it takes a lot of writing and rewriting. So in that regard, I don't think the editing, editing service can provide you a good suggestion in terms of a structure. <laughs> So they mostly can help you with those language issues. But in order to figure out the structure issues, you really need to think and rewrite. So it's a very complicated process involving your understanding of the materials and also kind of do some reasonings. You just say, okay, how really, what's the best ways to convince people? So, so I, think, and I think when you move on to the kind of coherence part, I think you really need to do a lot of kind of thinking and rewriting on your own side. Okay, and we have another question. Um, if if um, you would like, to, if you could recommend one book on effective writing skills, which one would that be? I think uh, I think for, I, I I'm very happy to find a book uh, which is listed as the first one in these slides, a handbook for international students. So so I think uh, I think that basically is, this book is particularly targeted for international students. So, so, I, I, so there are some kind of, it really, really touch on some very basic rules in terms of, okay, how to um, achieve a good writing. So I, I think I'm, at this moment, I would like to re recommend this book to the attendees. Um, yeah, we're unfortunately out of time. I think if there are any remaining questions, we'll try to get back to those who, um, who asked them uh, separately. Um, if I were just to sort of, 
you know, based on both Christie's and Lemon's presentation, just um, identify a few like common themes uh, for effective communication, whether orally or in writing. I guess uh, the three might be uh, know your audience and tailor your, your, your communication style accordingly. Um, the second might be to capture the interest, interest of the audience early on, right, whether it's a presentation or in a paper by being compelling. And the third, I guess there's just no getting around uh, the fact that good presentations and good writing just requires a lot of time and effort and practice. So uh, we all need to plan accordingly. And then to quote the Nike ad again, you know, just, just do it. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, we're out of time. Um, uh, this concludes our meetup. I'd like to thank again our two presenters and all of the attendees for participating. Um, we won't be circulating the slides, but this uh, meetup has been recorded and will be available on the NIST website. And following this meetup, you'll be receiving um, via email a link to three brief, uh, uh, a, a three question survey, so we can get your feedback on how we can improve our meetups and ideas for future ones. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for joining, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mimi. Thank you, Mimi.